Welcome to the Fandomize Podcast, where the fans are the stars. This is our very first podcast, and we're listening to music from Jonathan Colton. It's called Skull Crusher Mountain. If you check out the lyrics, you're going to love them. A little bit later on, we're going to have Sean Kleefels from MTV's Fanthropology and a lot more to talk about. So welcome aboard. I've enjoyed your stay so far. I see you met my assistant Scarface. His appearance is quite disturbing. I assure you he's harmless enough. He's a sweetheart, calls me master. And he has a way of finding pretty things. here today with Sean Kleefeld, who is the author of comic book Fanthropology, and he also writes the new, I believe, Fanthropology column for MTV Geek. That's correct. Uh, it's only, what, maybe about, not even two months old yet? Just about two months old? Yeah. Something like that. Well, I was so excited to see it, because uh, fandom is my life, <laughs> and so why don't we begin, you know, with the boring usuals. Why don't you tell me a little bit about how you came to write the book or the column, and a little bit about your fanish background. Sure. Um, well, yeah, I've been reading, it's obviously a uh, background in comics more so than anything else, and been reading them for pretty much as long as I can remember. Um, I know uh, my parents have pictures of me in like Batman t-shirts when I'm three years old or something. So it's, it, it's been long and coming. Um, and I, you know, I've just been reading comics forever and really interested in them and, um, uh, really enjoyed the, the, just the medium as a whole. And one of the things I've tried to do over my something, something years of reading comic books has been just to Keep expanding my horizons with it, you know. So when I was when I was a kid, I was reading just the superhero stuff, and as I got older, I started seeing some of the independent stuff, uh, independent comics, and some of the the interesting things that were going on there. Kind of it broadened it out into the the medium as a whole, and started learning more about the creators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I think it was about ten or fifteen years ago, I finally got to the point where I was like you know what, there's this whole other side of the equation is the people who are reading this stuff, not the guys who are creating it, not the, the people who are producing all these great books, but the people who are reading all of them, and there's that whole community thing going on there, and what's that all about? Um, and so I started looking into it uh, and trying to figure out what, what exactly was going on here and, and what, um, what just what that was, you know? Um, I grew up in a really small town, so I didn't have a big fandom experience myself growing up. Uh, it was mostly, you know, me alone in my bedroom reading comics, and, and that was it. And there was a couple of people I knew who read a little bit, but not too many. Um, and they weren't nearly as into it as I was. So I didn't have a good sense of people that were out there and... and you know, doing their, their own thing and what that was about. Um, I kind of had a vague sense that there were people out there from, you know, letter columns and that kind of thing, but that was about it. Um, so I started researching on, on fandom, and at the time, like I said, this was about 10, 15 years ago, there was almost nothing written about comic book fans. Um, nothing serious at any rate. There was a, a handful of, hey, look at this, you know, dork or, or look at this geek or that kind of thing. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot going on at the time. And what, so what I ended up doing is I was like, okay, well, let me see if I can, uh, slide sideways a bit and look at science fiction fandom. Cause I, my, my thought was, uh, intuitively that, you know, they're pretty, probably pretty similar. There's probably a lot of overlap there. 
Um, and, there, and did you find there was a lot of overlap there? Well, yeah, um, I, there was actually a, a bit of uh, research done on science fiction fans. Um, the, the, the primary author I was looking at at the time was a man named uh, Professor Henry Jenkins. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him or not. I am. Ex- and he was, I, you know, I read some of his, his uh, earlier pieces and was absolutely astounded as I'm reading through it. And I was like, this sounds like everything that I've seen in comic books. You know, it just replaced Star Trek with Fantastic Four or, you know, Star Wars with Superman or whatever. And you've got pretty much the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that kind of broadened my interest in general to, to fandom as a whole. Um, and I kind of got it into my head. It was like, well, you know, I've been doing this research and I'm seeing how all of these pieces start, are starting to click together. But there's still very few, few writings on comic book fandom, which is where I got the idea of, well, OK, since it's not out there, I'm just going to have to write the damn book myself. You know, since nobody else is doing it. Um, so I started pulling my research together on that. Um, and I was kind of collecting more and more data and kind of a little hesitant, I have to admit, to uh, pull the trigger, as it were. Um, and uh, one of the things I realized somewhere in there was it, this would be essentially my first book. And who am I to, to put out a book there? about anything, who the hell would buy a book by Sean Kleefeld when no one knows who their Sean Kleefeld guy is? Um, so I started a blog up um, with kind of a dual intention of, A, putting my name out there and trying to drum up some interest and in just, you know, me as a person and, hey, I have something to say and it's worth listening to, and B, just to practice writing more, you know, and just to sit down every day and, and have a blank page and come up with uh, something vaguely coherent and, and sensical. Um, so I did for, uh, did just kind of a straight blog about comic books, uh, cleefeldarncomics.com, and did that for, I think, four or five years, and um, finally said, you know what, okay, I just need to go ahead and do this damn book. So I spent about, I don't know, I think it was about two months, three months, something like that, powered through a ton of research, um, trying to pull together exactly how I want the book structured and how to, how to organize the whole thing. Um, and basically spent all of my free time just writing this book, either writing or researching on this book. Um, and finally pulled all that together and put it out there. And it has, you know, I knew from the get-go that it wasn't going to fly off the shelves, not a hot seller. There's not a, a big demand for this kind of thing still. But I'm still uh, I'm still proud of what I came up with, and I think that I turned in something pretty decent. Um, nice nice overview of comic book fans, which um, there's been a there's been a few more uh, people interested in that kind of thing now, but it still uh, still doesn't have a, as much draw as I think it should. But so that's uh, that's kind of how I got to the book. Well, let me ask you a question there, and kudos to just doing the book because you know how many people say I'm gonna I'm gonna and right. never do so the fact that you pulled it together and you put it out there is amazing and uh, I'm proud of you for uh, for doing Thank that you. and I'm wondering what the comics were you know obviously so huge to pop culture in the 50s and even through into the 60s and then they kind of started to fade a little bit mm-hmm. and disagree if you, if you if you do but I feel like we've sort of started to have a rebirth maybe not as i don't know that it's as big as it was in the past uh it it absolutely is it's a rebirth um there's a that a, i'm sure you know that you know it, it kind of died out in a lot of uh, in the mid to late 50s largely because of the juvenile hearings on juvenile delinquency and and henry wortham mm-hmm. or, or frank worth frederick worth i'm sorry uh, and, you know, comics are turning kids gay and comics are evil and, you know, that whole business. So there was that huge cutoff there in, in the late 50s, um, basically, you know, cutting themselves off the knees. Um, but now video games are evil, so it's OK a, to go back to comics. You know, that, that's kind of one of the interesting things, too, is, you know, I was saying there's the parallels between science fiction and comic book fandom. And, and you see the same thing with almost every medium, too, every new 
uh, piece that comes out there gets blamed for, you know, whatever the current problems are. You know, first it was radio, then it was television, then it was comic books, then it's, you know, then it's movies, then it's video games. You know, it's they just move from one to the next. Mm -hmm. um, so then, uh, so, so comics kind of uh, ended up with this stigma of, of being for kids and not being very intelligent and, and just being trashy garbage that nobody really wants to have anything to do with. Um, and it took a long time to get get over that. Um, and I, I think that honestly, that really started probably in the uh, the mid '80s when you start getting mm -hmm. books out there like Mouse, which won a freaking Pulitzer, you know. And people started saying, "Oh, hey, wait a minute, this is it won a Pulitzer. That must be worth something," um, you know. And obviously, Dark Knight and Watchmen, and you know, all the all the ones that kind of everybody knows, um, they were. All kind of came around in the in the mid '80s there, and people started saying, "Oh, wait, yeah, you can do something decent with that." Um, and interestingly, right around the same time, there were a couple of publishers who said, "Hey, you know what? Comics are really big in Japan too, so let's bring them over into the United States and translate them, and that'll be easy money." Uh, and so we started seeing manga start coming through too, and people were seeing, "Oh, wait, it's not just superheroes. There's also you know these romance comics and these." sport comics and you know all the other genres that the japanese do that, that we don't here in the states um and so it's taken you know 15 20 years um to kind of build that up um and it wasn't until it really wasn't until you started seeing the, the producers who grew up with that getting into hollywood and saying oh you know what i read this really cool story it would make a great film it was uh you know uh, about this thing called Ghost World, or you know, it was this thing called History of Violence, or whatever. Um, and they started bringing those in and trying to bring that out into a broader culture because that was something that they saw back in the '80s and really liked. Um, so then now, you know, you flash forward to, to mid 2000s, late 2000s, then you get, you know, uh, everybody and their brother wants to make a movie about a comic book for MPV, you know, whether it's X-Men or Spider-Man or, you know, whatever else is, is on the slate right now, uh, the Avengers, you know, that, that whole business. Um, so uh, people are starting to, the big name people, it's kind of filtered up long enough now that we're at the stage where the, the people with a lot of money in Hollywood are saying, oh, hey, there's money to be had here. Look, Avengers was the top grossing movie of the year, and Spider-Man was the top grossing movie of that year, and, you know, on and on and on, and they basically see, oh, well, superheroes, comic books equals money, and we don't have to do any development costs. Let's run with it. Well, what's interesting about that, I don't know if you've heard it yet today, Jaws Whedon was at the ABC Upfronts today talking about the new Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, TV show that's coming out. But what he said that was really fascinating was that he felt that this show would force people to own up to how they really feel. And what he said is men are going to admit they like emotional content. Women, you know, we'll see that women enjoy action. Kids can watch complex storytelling and grownups can still love comic books. Yeah. And, you know, it's for him to stand in front of this entire room full of advertisers and say, you know, this is, you know, we're putting this out there and yeah, it's a comic book, but it's okay. Sort of really, really basically saying it's okay to really enjoy this. Um, and at the same time say it's, it isn't, as you were saying, it's not a comic book in the sense like a throwaway. Yeah. It's still complex storytelling with characters that you're really going to become involved in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a big sleigh. I don't know. I don't know if he can carry it off. If anybody can, I think he probably yeah, he, can. He'd be one of the people who could pull it off. That's what, um, you know, going into the Avengers movie, I was, you know, I was kind of skeptical because, I mean, that, there's a huge number of variables thrown in there, the least of which is the egos of all the actors involved, <laughs> you know. Um, but I thought, you know, if anybody's going to pull that off, Whedon would be the guy. So, and obviously he did. Well, why do you think that, other than what we talked about, you had said about comic books sort of having that um, that stigma that they had. When you add fandom on top of it, fandom always seems to come out with the bad end of the deal. Like people, why do people think fans are crazy? 
What does the rest of the world think? Fans are crazy. Uh, because they are. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, you know, I, I kind of joke about that. It's, but it's it's not it's not entirely uh, untrue. I mean, you think about it. Sure. Is what logical reason is there for you know spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to dress yourself up like a Gundam, you know, <laughs> or or you know buying tons and tons of comic books or buying and memorizing every episode of Star Trek or, you know, you know whatever, whatever fanish activities you're into, uh, there's, if, if you're not into, if, if somebody else is not into that, it's hard to process why anybody would be, you know, they, they look at, you know, you, you look at those old Star Trek, for example, the, the original series Star Trek, that was a product of its time, obviously. Mm-hmm. And with whatever it is, 30, 40 years of hindsight, it looks cheesy in a lot of cases. I mean, that, I'm sorry, that's a guy in a rubber suit. You know, it's not Absolutely. a good person. Um, and, you know, James Kirk violates the Prime Directive in every episode. Why the hell is he even <laughs> bothering to talk about it? You know, and there's, there's a lot of chintziness and a lot of cheesiness involved in that, especially, you know, like I said, with that retrospect. Um, so it's easy to dismiss that, you know, without having, if you weren't one of those guys who, who were watching the show when it came out, you know, and you didn't have that emotional connection to it, um, you know, it's easy to say, what the hell are you doing? You know, what, why is it, why are you getting so interested about some really cheesy 40 year old television program? Why are you interested in this pulp paper with, four color people wearing spandex jumping around hitting each other, you know, <laughs> um, you, you take that, you can take that argument to pretty much anything. And just, it's a matter of just not understanding and not appreciating what somebody gets out of the fandom. Um, and then and the, the root, the root of fandom, just as the definition of the word fan, I mean, that comes from the word fanatic. Right. I mean, you, you have to be fanatic about whatever it is, you know, again, Star Trek, Star Wars, comic books, my, my little pony, you know, whatever your whatever your interest is. Um, you, you have to, to really be a fan of that. You have to have that emotional connection and you have to really just kind of get into it for whatever whatever reasons you're interested in, whatever properties or whatever things you're interested in. You know, that, that's fine. That's cool. Um, but. Other people aren't usually aren't prescient enough to step outside themselves and say, "Oh, wait, your interest in My Little Pony gives you the same kind of feeling and reaction when I'm watching football, or you know, when I'm right. when I'm uh, at watching NASCAR or watching, uh, you know, uh, my uh, honey, whatever, Honey Boo Boo or whatever the hell that shit. Right. You know, whatever interest they have." They can't, um, there, there's usually not enough self-recognition to kind of step outside yourself and saying, wait a minute, you're getting the same thing out of comic books, Star Wars, whatever, that I'm getting out of football, basketball, baseball, whatever. Uh, right. And when they buy a season ticket and paint themselves purple, that's okay right. for the football game, right. you know, but then you show up in a Star Trek uniform and people think you're nuts. So it's kind of, it's sort of interesting. And when you talk NASCAR, like, they're really known for their fandom. Oh, yeah. I mean, that that's a fandom, you know. But uh, and even and musicians too. It seems like there's acceptable forms, as yeah, it were. And that's it's it's the way all of these different things kind of grew up. I, I read a piece recently uh, by Seth Godin. Uh, he's a marketing kind of guru. I know. Him. Okay, he had a piece on a, on his blog. I I don't know, six or eight months ago, maybe, about football. Um, and it was basically the history of professional football almost perfectly coincided with the history of television. And so what happened was that, that, you know, football was just kind of coming into its own as a thing, right? Didn't exist in the 1800s or anything. So just as football was kind of coming together as an actual profession of any sort was exactly the same time that television was kind of coming in into its own. And so there was a big, you know, there was a uh, kind of a connection, a synergy there 
that football got started showing on television. And that drew in, that was the first mass media of the time, right? So that drew in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And you would have the whole family would sit down and watch football because that was the only thing that was on at that point, right? I mean, there wasn't, we didn't have, there was three channels, right? We didn't have, yep. uh, you know, the zillion cable channels and DVDs and, uh, and DVRs and all that. Um, you had to watch what was on, and it was pretty much news or football, you know? So that developed into this kind of uh, large kind of cultural acceptance for, uh, at first, football and primarily football, but also any of the other sports because those were the original uh, reality programming, if you will. You know, that was, it, it was easy for uh, a television camera to set up in the bleachers and point the camera down at the field and broadcast the game and, you know, have one guy sitting on the side explaining what was going on, which they were doing for the lady. Um, that just happened to, that, because that's why football is, for example, a bigger sport in the United States than anywhere else in the world. And that's why soccer and, you know, high lie and, and whatever other sports you can name don't have the popularity of football. You know, it, it was basically a cultural phenomenon that's carried on for, you know, what, 60 years now, something like that. Well, and when you talk about cultural phenomena, that really leads well into what you're covering in your column on MTV, because what has always fascinated me about fandom is as different as fandoms are, we're all very much the same. And mm -hmm. fandom is a very small world in its own way. Uh, when you're in a fandom, it's amazing how many of the same people you come in contact with, oh. you know, even though it's, it's a big world. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, and, and that's, um, that's kind of deliberate though. I mean, you don't, I think at a, um, at, at your own kind of, not necessarily a conscious level, but you're at some level thinking as an individual, you know, okay, I'm interested in, again, whatever my particular thing is, Star Wars, Star Trek, whatever. Um, so you're going to follow and be attracted to the people who are also into that, right? I mean, that's what fandom mm -hmm. is, at a nutshell. Um, but as you start meeting those other people, you know, this you're going to be attracted to and catch up with the people who not only are into that same thing, but are into it for the same reasons that you are, right? So, you know, like not everybody reads uh, comic books and treats them the same way, right? You know, the, the, guy, right. the guys who love Batman love comic books because of something that they get out of Batman, which is a very different experience than somebody who reads comic books and gets something out of, I'm trying to think of a good example, of, say, XKCD, you know, webcomic. Total, totally different type of thing. Totally different type of experience. They're still comics, but two different audiences because they're getting different things out of them. Um, and the same could be said for even, I mean, you could look at it at a, at a microcosm too, right? There are guys who get out of Batman some whatever emotional connection it is they um you know they really like the kind of the comedy campy adam west thing that goes out in, in some issues right they, they love the batman of the 50s and 60s and you know the robotic dinosaurs and battling space aliens in para olympic games or you know whatever kind of weird ass crap that they came up with back then um and there are other people who said you know what frank miller is the shit and I'm sorry, I don't know if I can say that, uh, but... <laughs> Too late, you already I did. did. You'll believe me if you have to. But they can say Frank Miller is the shit, and, and Dark Knight Returns is the epitome of a Batman story. And they, you know, these two people both love Batman, but love him for different reasons. And different, they get different things out of those two different types of stories. Um, and where I'm going with that is then the people who are you know, the, as an individual, if you happen to be the kind of person who likes the Frank Miller Batman, you're going to gravitate to the same types of things that all the other people who get those same types of things out of the Frank Miller Batman. True. You know, so there's there's a, a certain aesthetic there. There's a certain uh, uh, 
a story quality and emotional attachment that you get out of that particular type of story that you don't get out of the stuff that you know Adam West did, right? And, and what yeah, what's funny on that is I'm a um, big supernatural uh, fangirl, and what I find is a lot of the other people in the fandom are into we're all into the same other shows, uh, white collar and things. And you, when you boil it down, you're right. It comes to that. Usually it's that buddy aspect, that brotherly, whether actual brothers or brothers in arms, but it is that connection. Mm -hmm. It's not because certainly white collar is not a horror show. And I like supernatural because it's a horror show, but yeah, it's that underlying emotion that we get from it. And I am always amazed at how many people, you know, we all like the same little microcosm shows. Yeah, and that's and that's like I said, that to some degree, that's kind of a self-selection on your part, because, you know, you you've already established. Okay, you know what? I like Supernatural, and my friend Bob likes Supernatural. My friend Joe likes Supernatural, and Sally likes Supernatural, and you know whomever. Um, and you already got a, a a connection with them as individuals, and so when you kind of shift over to something else. You know, you can kind of bring those guys over as well and say, hey, you know what, Bob, I'm watching Supernatural. You're watching Supernatural. Hey, there's this other story that's really cool and kind of like the same thing. I get the same kind of jive out of it. Mm -hmm. Let's go over together. Right. So you can you can kind of shift your your whole circle of friends over in that same direction. Uh, oh, bringing people into your fandom. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> well, you know, at some level, it's not, though. I mean, like I said, you've already kind of got that that connection going at some point, you know, like, if, if, like, for example, again, if you like, if you both like supernatural, uh, you know, you can slide over to the next thing. I mean, you know, we, we were talking about Joss Whedon earlier, same kind of thing. There was that contingent of folks who really loved what he was doing with Buffy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when he started angel, it's a, it was a, I mean, it's obviously a spinoff, but it's talking to the same, kind of thing so it's easy for all those people to slide over and then he goes over to I think uh, Firefly and that was you know he's got a different group and it's a slightly different setup but he's still talking to the same kind of ideas at some level so you can still slide those people over again and Firefly gets canceled canceled so he does Dollhouse and you get those same people to slide over again you're not really introducing a new fandom per se, uh, I don't think. You're you're uh, you're not dragging people in and saying, "Oh, well, hey, look, this this Firefly thing is awesome because it's got this, that, and the other." I mean, there is some of that you, that you can do as well. But the people who were on board for Buffy in the first place, you know, they're still Buffy fans and they're still Angel fans, but they can also be Firefly fans, and you're all talking in the same circle anyway. You know, so and what's interesting on that concept, and I saw somebody writing about it this week, was that particularly in TV and movie fandom, this concept of being a fan of a creator and not necessarily the show, mm -hmm. as we've done with Jaws and, and J.J. Abrams to some extent, I think, is getting there, uh, is actually probably more relevant in comic book terms okay. because I imagine there are people who follow particular artists or particular writers yeah. throughout a career. Yeah, um, it's it's – it's very prevalent in some medium over others, mainly because of the marketing behind it. Um, you know, it, it started like science fiction was big into creators originally because mm -hmm. they didn't really have series per se, right? Um, there were a few, but like I'm talking back in the 30s and 40s and whatever. Um, you were following a particular writer, you know, whether it was Ray Bradbury, Isaac Asimov, you know, whomever. Um, their stories don't necessarily correlate with one another. That's not necessarily part of a series, but you, what you got out of the Isaac Asimov story, you can find the same type of thing in any Isaac Asimov story. So you follow him as a creator. Um, and comic books have only been doing that uh, and promoting the creator aspect of it for really, I don't know, maybe since the 1960s would probably be about uh, when that would have started. And it's to a point where now where, yeah, the creator name almost trumps the, the characters. So it's not it's not necessarily that you want to read Superman, but you want to read Grant Morrison's Superman or, you know, John Byrne's Superman or whatever. Um, and television has kind of worked this is television has a, for a long time 
kind of downplayed the creator aspect of it. I mean, yeah, they, they put the credits up there on who wrote the show, who produced right. it, whatever. But there, was, there wasn't a whole lot of continuity. And when they did get a, uh, a show, uh, get, you know, there would be a string of, you know, 20 creators working on, you know, Welcome Back Hotter. You know, it's a half-hour sitcom. <laughs> where, <laughs> and you've got a list of 30 or 40 guys that, that worked on it. You know, you can't really say, okay, yeah, this is, I'm watching this show because so-and-so worked on it. Because, well, I, I actually, uh, uh, there's a guy I kind of know, Mark Evanier, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, writer. He actually, that was his first gig, was writing on Welcome Back Hotter. Mm -hmm. and he worked with a group of other writers and put the show together and he said he would maybe get one or two lines of his into a show you know <laughs> i mean kind of, yeah. at the time he was that kind of far down on the totem pole he wasn't the lay writer by any means but the fact is that you know if you're watching welcome Matt cotter his mom might have been watching to see his name show up on there and watching because he was part of that but there would be pretty much no one else besides his mother watching for that, right? Because, like I said, he'd get maybe one or two lines in per show, and the rest of it was kind of a group effort, and you couldn't really tell necessarily who did what line or or who put what in there. And even when they did, the actor might change it. Um, so it's only been, I, I would say, a really, probably, I would, I would kind of peg it back to... Um, I think I would go back to like the late seventies before you started seeing that with with movies at all, and you start getting mm -hmm. you know the George Lucases and the Steven Spielbergs and those kind of guys really making uh, a definitive imprint on the name uh, you know as a creator. This is you know Star Wars. This is something I wrote, I directed, I produced. Um, and granted, Lucas got other people to help him for the other movies and whatever, but. The first movie, that was all. That was pretty much all him. Good, bad, and ugly. That was him. Uh, Spielberg did the. You know, he was writer, producer, director for. Uh, you know, all of his early films as well. Um, so you kind of start to get that creator vibe in movies, and that's only I think I have, I don't follow television that much, but that's only recently come to television. You're starting to get that with guys like Joss Whedon. Um, yeah. I think we had it a little bit, and, and it's driving me crazy because I can't think of who it was. When Hill Street Blues came out, the um, creator behind that, and it's, it's not even, I can't think of his name, um, but there started to be the places where they became household names, as it were. Mm -hmm. Nobody before that, unless you were in the industry, you didn't know who created or wrote or directed a show, and you didn't care, I guess. But more and more, we've had a few of these, you know, when Norman Lear and people started really knowing – his work and um you know it, i come from the school of Irwin allen mm -hmm. and love love Irwin allen and we always say that allen and, and alfred hitchcock in the movies were so ahead of their time in the sense that like they would have been terrific on dvd because they oh. were the guys who went out in front of their shows and did the marketing and the promo mm -hmm. and made it about the fact that it was theirs yeah yeah and i think we're starting to see that again now you know, people know who J.J. Abrams is. People know who Shonda Rhimes is. There's a few people in TV and directors also in movies that people now, you hear the name and it means something yeah. to the marketing yeah. effort. Um, and that's, that's like I said, that's fairly recent uh, with, with television and movies um, from the standpoint of, and the reason why I think is, is it not so much that the creators are doing any less work or more work or different types of work. But the, the the executives, the marketing people and whatnot are starting to recognize that people are generating these followings. You know, they, they look at a Joss Whedon and say, oh, crap, people were not watching it because it's Buffy. They're watching it because it's Joss Whedon's Buffy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and they're starting to recognize that there's a marketing angle to that and they can say, from, you know, that, and that's why you see on uh, the movie promos anyway, from the creator of, from the producer of, from the director of, you know, uh, the trailers, you know, when they, right. when they have some kind of brand new movie that's coming out that they don't think people really will catch on to, they start throwing that stuff up there because they know those other names will be recognizable now. 
Uh, right. And they're doing that more on TV, you know, as well, especially as more big screen directors are coming back to television. Yeah. So they're like, yeah, let's use this name to say, you know, hey, it's a TV show with Michael Bay. It's a, you know, to, even if they don't use the names, as you're saying, they're doing a lot of promotion of from the men who brought you the new Star Trek movie, exactly. you know, now here, yeah. you know, from the man who brought you Terminator here. Yeah. So, yeah, let's um, I want to talk a little bit about the Internet, um, specifically in fandom. What do you think? The internet has done good or bad for fandom, comic book fandom specifically. If you're more comfortable there, um, it's been it's been phenomenal. I mean, it is it has been absolutely phenomenal. Like I, like I was saying earlier, when I was a kid reading comic books, I was by myself. You know, I mean, granted, reading comic books is kind of a solitary activity by nature, but you know, when I would go to school the next day, you know, I talk about you know the latest issue of whatever and I nobody. There'd be a, I had a handful of my close friends who kind of knew that I read comic books and would be able to say, okay, he's, I yeah, he's talking about Fantastic Four. I think I that's the with the rock guy and the fire guy, right? Yeah, whatever. Um, but there wasn't a. I wasn't able to really connect with anybody uh, on those issues, you know, and even through college, you know, I, I went to a really small high school. So that didn't surprise me growing up. You know, I, by the time I was, you know, 14, 15, 16, I, was, I recognized it's just too small of a town for me to really connect with, with anybody on this kind of stuff. Um, but then even when I went to college, which was a good-sized university, um, I was still having trouble getting a hold of and finding people with kind of similar interests uh, as me. Um, so then when the internet comes around and I can log in to originally AOL and whatever, and they have these, you know, these chat rooms and these uh, message boards that are uh, not only talking about, you know, comics, but they're talking about, ooh, just Marvel comics. And look, here's a subsection on just Fantastic Four comics within Marvel, and, you know, that kind of thing. And you can really, I, that's when I really started getting you know, that, those connections that I, I missed for, for whatever, 20-some years uh, growing up. Um, and, you know, the, some of it's actually interesting is those message boards that started, uh, what, I guess, must have been 20, 25 years ago now. Yeah, yeah. I'm still friends with some of those people. I, as a matter of fact, there was one of the guys, um, I saw him two weeks ago. I think it was. I met up with him first time. I'd seen him in like three years or something. But we're still friends, you know. Um, and, um, you know, the, the re one of the reasons um, that I wrote the book, um, this, I'll, I, this, uh, it's a little bit of a tragic story, but, it, but it's poignant, I think. Um, there was a... There were several years... Before I wrote the book, I was running a Fantastic Four website, uh, fan site. And it was, uh, at the time, it was the biggest one of all the fan sites out there. You know, it was uh, a bunch of them out there at the time. Mine was the, by far the largest. I'd like to say the best, but that's, you know, obviously I'm a biased on that one. Um, but one of the guys I met through there ended up doing a lot of writing for the site uh, for me. And we became good friends, and we talked all the time, and not just about... Uh, and this was this is the the epitome of what fandom does, right? Is we were talking all the time originally about the Fantastic Four because it was Fantastic Four fan site, but then also started getting into other stuff that we both like, you know, and talking about uh, Doctor Who or uh, he was talking about Albert Pernay and as you know was a favorite author of his, and you know then we started getting into personal issues and he was you know having trouble with this girl and you know I want to ask her on a date and yada 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 all that um and we became really good friends because we were doing this over the course of like six or eight years or something going back and forth all the time never met him never met him in person yeah that's another thing people don't understand with, with fandom but i totally <laughs> uh, yeah i'm right there with you but then um but then what was weird is it went i i didn't hear from him for i think it was like two or three months um and all of a sudden then i get this email uh, from somebody who was announcing him and announced himself as his brother, as my friend's brother, and said, you know, I'm, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but 
Greg who died. Um, and he was, you know, just trying to alert all the people that was basically in, in his, um, his email friends list or whatever. Um, this was prior to Facebook, prior to MySpace, all of that stuff. Um, and he was just trying to, his, uh, my friend's brother was just trying to alert everybody and say, you know what, here's, here's what I know, here's what happened and whatever. Um, and I, re I got that email like I said, I'd never met this guy, never met him in person. My only communication was with, uh, was online. And I read this email and I just sat there stunned. You know, I just, I, I stared at my computer screen for, I, I think it was like a good eight or 10 hours or something. And I got nothing accomplished at work. Um, you know, it was, it was a friend who died. Um, and it, absolutely tragic. Um, that it was this guy that we I had this good connection with because of the internet, because we had been talking back and forth, and I had a very real personal connection to him. I knew what he looked like, you know, we'd shared photos of each other and whatever. Um, but I had this very real connection, this emotional connection with this guy um, who, you know, like I said, we became really good friends. Um, and it was you know, seeing him die, or, you know, virtually, was just as powerful as seeing any other person I knew and was friends with that had died, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And it's, like I said, it's a, it, was, it was a tragic story in that sense, but at the same time, if the internet wasn't there, I would have never met him in the first place. Um, and... That a, a part of part of that relationship and part of that experience, um, and I went, I think I started thinking this before he, his actual death, but certainly by the time he died, that was really what got my butt in gear to write the book in the first place. You know, because I really started at that point reflecting on, wow, I've never met this guy and still have this huge connection to him, and. Um, where did where did that come from? Why was that there? Um, and that's when I really really started getting interested in fandom as a whole, is because there was that connection. And I just that was not something I experienced growing up, and, you know, in this little small town, with you know I think it had a population of like seven thousand or eight thousand or something for most of the years I was there. I just didn't get that connection with with anybody else uh, growing up. You know, that's I had not that I didn't have friends, but not at that level. You know. Well, it's different, and what's interesting about that as well. I have a friend who's new to the concept of fandom. It it really wasn't something that she'd grown up with or really had become interested in until she fell in with supernatural, and we welcomed her into the fold. <laughs> right. And and one of the things that she often marvels at is that connection that she's made to people, myself and a couple of other people. And she lives in Australia. I'm in California. We, we have yet to meet. It's going to happen soon, but we've yet to meet. Yeah. And, you know, she will often say how insane it is. Like if you explain that to anybody, that you could feel that close to someone that you have not met, that, you know, you do only know virtually. Yeah. And it's – um. That's what the Internet, yeah, has done for yeah. us. It, but it's still very hard to explain I, people who are on the Internet but don't. It's a, well, it's a fandom thing. Well, it is a fandom I mean, thing. What you have to do is um, you, you basically you get out what you put into it, right? I mean, if you, if you don't go to any of the message boards or, you know, you don't contribute to any of the message boards, or you don't contribute on Twitter, you don't, you're not adding anything to Facebook, or you know, whatever venue that you're using online, um, if you're just sitting there reading the crap that other people are writing and watching their videos, and you know, even if you enjoy them, even if you appreciate what they're doing, you're not getting that emotional connection because you're not, it, it's kind of a one-way street, right? You know, you, you have to put something out there yourself, um, put something out there of yourself and that's where you get that connection with people. And, and you know, and it's, it, it's like real life. It's hard, you know, and there's going to be a lot of people who, 
you know, think you're being a jerk or disagree with you on something or whatever. Not everybody gets together about everything. That's cool. I mean, that's what makes the world go around, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But, yeah, if you don't, uh, if you're not putting yourself out there and trying to make a connection with somebody online, you're not going to. So talking about putting yourself out there, let's wrap around to your column um, on MTV, why don't you, MTV Geek Online. Sure. Why don't you uh, tell me a little bit more about that and what you see that as, where you're going with it. Okay. Um, well, like I said, it's still fairly new, I think, you know, like about two months or so. Um, and that was something I, I'd actually been writing for MTV for, I guess, about two years now. Um, I had a column on web comics, and that was made actually through a, interestingly enough, through a series of connections that basically go back to a fandom base in the original back in the day uh, type of thing. Just long, kind of convoluted story to get to that, so I won't bore you with it. But um, so I've been right, working on this uh, web comics column, and I wrote to my editor and said, "Hey, you know what? I've got some time open." Um, I'd love to contribute more. Can I throw out, pitch some other ideas? And she said, sure. And one of the ideas I threw out there was um, something about fandom. Uh, because, you know, I, by this point, I'd already written the book. I obviously had, had the interest there. And she said, that's, that's fantastic. That's exactly, we'd love to, we'd actually love to try and get more interest and more talking about fandom specifically. Uh, so go full steam ahead, take off. Uh, so that's that's kind of where it came from originally. Um, and what I've been trying to do with it is um, is actually a lot harder than I anticipated, <laughs> i got to admit, because I've only got about a thousand words per column to work with. Um, and this is a topic that I filled an entire book with and probably could fill another one if I really wanted to. Um, it's There's a lot lot to go over there um and so what i end up trying to do is try to talk to various aspects of of what fandom is at, at kind of a base level you know trying to get going back to that emotional connection trying to talk about that that sense of community uh that sense of belonging and joining with uh, other kind of like-minded people um and trying to touch on as many different aspects of that, uh, whether that's uh, kind of you know uh, groups within fandom, um, you know within a within a particular fandom, or just fandom as a whole, or uh, talking about science fiction versus comic books versus you know uh, romance versus whatever, or you know, subgenres within that, Star Trek versus Star Wars, you know, all of that, and basically trying to... We're all doing the same thing, you know. <laughs> we're, all, we're all putting ourselves out there. We're all trying to make connections with other people. We're all trying to be friends with somebody and feel part of a group and try to feel wanted and try to feel part of community that we're contributing to and, and are... Uh, you know, we're, we're supportive of and they're supportive of us and whether you do that through uh, Twilight or through Buffy or through Star Wars or through Star Trek or through Legos or through My Little Pony or whatever, whatever your thing is, we're all doing the same thing. And would you just shut up about it and recognize that so you don't piss on everybody else's parade? <laughs> Uh, and why can't we all just get along? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a kind of stupid message when when you say it like that, but that's what it ultimately is, you know. Um, I mean, the, the story that absolutely kills me is the when the first Twilight movie came out. Um, the that came out in that was a fall release or something, and the summer before at San Diego Comic Convention, they had most of the main actors, the director, and they showed. Uh, clips of the movie at you know one of the convention panels, and the books had been around, so there was this huge following already. All these fans uh, who had read the books and loved the books and big fans of the book, whole thing, great. 
and they came in and stormed through and they did their thing and they had this huge line for the panel you know, literally a day and a half before it started right the, they literally camped out with with tents and the whole bit and that pissed off everybody else at the convention you know all these the guys walking around in woofy costumes and with Spock ears and you know, the, the comic book guy from The Simpsons there who's got the bag of, of Taco Bell burritos, you know, that he's munching on all day and hasn't showered in a month. You know, it pissed off all of those people because they're saying, what are you doing here? You know, you don't, you don't belong here. You don't look like us. You know, you're, you're, not, part of, you're not one of us. You're, you're doing this weird Twilight thing. Vampires don't sparkle, damn it. You know? And there was this huge outcry of people getting pissed off. There were these uh, spontaneous um, protests would would jump up, and people would actually take pieces of cardboard and, and write them up, and hold them up as placards, and say, you know, vampires don't sparkle, and you know the the whole bit. And it just pissed everybody off. And I'm sitting back here reading about this. I didn't go to San Diego. I've never been actually. And I'm sitting back on the internet reading about all these things going on. And I was like. This was entirely predictable. This was, this is exactly what would happen when you do this. You know, you've got two different groups with two different fandoms, and they're they're butting heads because they're hitting in the same space and trying to talk to each other. And the Twilight fans, to their credit, you know, they were just like, "I'm just here to see these cool actors. You know, I'm just here to see this clip of this movie." I don't care about all this, you know, the superhero crap and the Star Wars and all uh, science fiction stuff. I don't care about any of that. I'm just here for these guys. That's all I want to do. I'm just going to mind my own business and get my, uh, you know, my photograph with the actors or an autograph or whatever it was they were looking for. Um, but they were encroaching in on this other territory that was supposedly, quote unquote, owned by the science fiction comic book geek crowd, you know, whatever you know, whatever you want to call that they didn't fit in right um and that was an that was absolutely 100 percent predictable that that would have happened regardless regardless of i mean the, the comic book fans the science fiction fans were saying they're in the way i'm having because they're camping out i'm tripping over them and all that that was just an excuse you know that was they weren't that wasn't that the the convention folks were not handling the the extra crowds or anything that was the same number of people as the year before overall um there were convention there were panels at previous years that you know people camped out for the night before that was they were just pissed off because there was somebody who was not them at the convention and you've seen this for years and years and years this with the, the first science fiction convention that had comic books in it same thing happened exact same thing people the science fiction guys said who the hell are these people uh, coming in on our territory um and the only reason it didn't carry as much weight is because it was whatever 1950 something and there was only 500 people at the show total right. you know so you know <laughs> as, as opposed to 500 just in the first quarter of the line yeah. right yeah and you know the comic book contingent at that convention was like 12 right so it's it wasn't a, as big of a deal in the sense that it just didn't have that scope that you have with San Diego, but it was the exact same thing, you know, is these people who are not us, they're, they don't have the same sensibilities as us, as I define them, they're in my space, you know, and they're, they're bringing their sparkly vampires or they're bringing their, uh, the, their superheroes with capes on them and spandex and whatever, whatever it is, that's not what I'm into. So you guys, I've just got wackadoodle stuff going on. Um, so I'm trying, what I'm trying to do, I, you know, like I said, it's kind, of, it's kind of cheesy, but I'm going back with my column and saying, well, listen, people, we're all doing the same shit. This is all the same business, and I don't care. I don't like My Little Ponies, but if you like My Little Ponies, that's fantastic. Love it. Go. Do whatever you want to do with them. I don't. And fans of anything, yeah, you're right. Should be the you think would be the people who would get it, you know? Right, but it's it's the exact same thing, and, and that you see with 
you know, the guys who, you know, put on the, the war paint and go to a football game and cheer and drink beer and, you know, do tailgating parties and all that. It's the same. They're doing the same thing to us, right, collectively. And, you know, let's, I'm just saying that I'm just saying, hey, listen, this is the same stuff going on. Don't perpetuate this. Don't, um, you know. Just, just recognize it for what it is. You know, it's they're doing something different. They're doing their own thing. They're not the fact that you have sparkly vampires out there does not impact in the slightest that there's a Bella Lugosi Dracula that's really fucking cool, or you know, or whatever version of the vampire mythos that you like, whether that's Twilight or the the Universal monster movies. Or Count Orlock from from Nosferatu, or the original Vlad the Impaler history lesson, you know, whatever version of that you like, there's no reason to to deny anybody else that they're liking of some other version, you know. That absolutely. I, I'm all just saying, yeah, can't we all just get along? <laughs> I like it, and I think that your column uh, is is definitely in that direction. I think you have a really interesting. Uh, way of talking about the subjects it's not quite academic but almost you know because mm-hmm. there's a lot of academics these days that i think more and more are writing about fandom the, yeah the, some of the companies that publish it uh, and i think you found that nice spot between not sounding like you're preaching and not sounding like you're trying to teach me a lesson but really saying you know here's another way to look at this uh and what was the one, uh, the big data one uh, that you had uh, yeah. the other day about fandom or something? It's big data. So it's, yeah, I thought it was uh, a really interesting approach, and I love that they're letting you write it, and I can't wait to see what else you're gonna put up. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> one of those. I, so, I have no idea what I'm, what's gonna be next week until I'm sitting down in front of the computer with a blank screen, going, "Oh crap! I got a deadline. I got to hit." <laughs> yeah, funny thing. Deadlines will do that too. Yeah. You go, "Oh shoot!" Yeah. I hear you. So on that note, I am going to let you go, and I really appreciate your joining me and telling me all these great stories, and um, there's definitely agree with you that it's time for fandoms to unite Absolutely. and show the world uh, what great power we have. Because, as I'm sure you do know, when fans get together, they are a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> so right, right, hopefully right, we'll use it for good. That it did. That's how bad it is. <laughs> All right, so thanks so much, Todd. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks, Cynthia. But I get the feeling that you don't like it. What's with all the screaming? You like monkeys. You like ponies. Maybe you don't like monsters so much. Maybe I use too many monkeys. Isn't it enough to know that I ruined a pony? Making a gift for you. Mountain is covered with wolves. Hear them howl.